she never saw herself as becoming the go-to voice on this particular topic, and yet her voice, her wisdom, her insight, well, she's become a very trusted resource. I'm Julie Lyles Carr. This is the Modern Motherhood Podcast from All Mom Does. And this is an episode you may want to put in those earbuds for. This is a very transparent and honest conversation that I have with Dr. Julie Slattery of Authentic Intimacy. Julie, thanks so much for being with me today. Oh, and thanks I just, for having me. Oh, it's just, it's exciting to be here sitting across the table from you on um, either side of some microphones. Now, I want to find out from you, how did you get into this lane? Because you're a strong believer and you just have such an amazing heart. And yet a lot of times topics surrounding sex can be taboo within mm-hmm. some of our faith communities. So how did you launch into this lane? Yeah, I started as a generalist in psychology, doing a lot of work just with women, married couples, I wrote a book on marriage. And I would guess that's probably the first time I kind of dipped my toe into the topic of sexuality because I had to. Right. If you write a book on marriage, you have to have a chapter on sex, which I did. It was one of the last chapters. Like, I've got to say something I've say about something. this. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't feel like I had a whole lot to say, but I kept getting asked then to speak on that particular chapter, uh, and that chapter became its own book. So I thought I was done, you know, with the whole sexuality topic, and just wanted to stay more a generalist in marriage and family issues and women's issues. And then about let's say I'm going to say like 2011, I was working at Focus on the Family, and really enjoying my time there. And God just started to take me on a really deep personal journey with him through probably about a year's time of just uh, unrest and seeking him and a desperation for him that I've never felt before, never felt since. But during that time, he really clearly just called me to address issues of sexuality and sexual brokenness. And it was so clear Again, it wasn't in one day, it was over the course of about a year mm-hmm. and that I left Focus on the Family and started this ministry called Authentic Intimacy. So it's just been a faith walk ever since then. It's not anything I would have signed up for. <laughs> uh, I needed God's wisdom and courage every day on the journey because the questions are getting even more difficult than they were when we started the ministry. Right, a lot more complex. So no. what was that like leaving a a ministry that has been so well known and has such a strong reputation? Because to me, I mean, for a lot of people to be like, well, man, that would be the dream, right? Like it getting was. to work at that kind yeah. of ministry. <laughs> and now I'm going to launch out on this thing that I never set out to be the, the sex girl anyway. <laughs> now I'm going to set out into this topic and this niche and on my own. What was that like in that moment to decide to do that? Yeah, it wasn't a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, yeah, but, um, you know, I think now I can look back and say I understand the difference between a dream and a call. And focus was a dream. And, uh, you know, it's part of God's plan for my life. And he used me there and he used focus in my life. Um, but that's very different from a direct call from the Lord mm, where you wow. just know this is what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know where or how to raise money. I, I don't know any of this. It's such a step of faith. Uh, but when God calls, and I know you've had that situation and other things that God's called you to, you don't doubt. You don't doubt how are we going to raise eight kids. You right, do it because right. you know it's what God has for you. And then you walk that out literally just one day at a time, asking for God's provision. So, you know, people sometimes ask me, like, were you scared? And are you, you know, did you doubt? And all that. It's like, no, when God makes it clear, you don't have to know where you're going. You just know you need to take that next step. Julie, I love that distinction between a dream and a call. And I think that we do live in a culture, even within our faith cultures, where we can sometimes get those things really confused because there is something that we think would be so cool to get to do. And then we can overlay it with a lot of God language and a lot of, you know, just grit. I'm going to get this thing done. But I think it's really powerful to understand the difference between those two things. That's mm-hmm. that's amazing. So in these years now, since 2012, what are some of the trends that you're seeing coming up when you're talking about sexuality and you're, you're speaking a lot of different places. You've written several more books. What are the things that keep coming up to the top when you're having those conversations? Yeah, well, there are a lot of new trends. A lot of new trends. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think even what the Me Too movement is showing us is that there has always been a significant amount of sexual brokenness that we've just 
shoved under the rug. Right. And I think particularly within faith communities, we've been uncomfortable not only to talk about healthy sexuality, but to talk about sexual abuse, incest, pornography. Um, those things have always existed, and they've always existed within the church. And um, so I think now people are feeling more uh, open to talk about what's going on. Um, because the culture is so open. So we're seeing people uh, in a good way more ready to come forward with saying, hey, I'm addicted to pornography or our marriage is really suffering related to sexuality. Uh, But I think there are some other unhealthy trends we're seeing. One of the biggest ones is that it's become normative, even within the Christian world, to separate sex from covenant. Right, uh, right, and God created sex to be intertwined. Not uh, we always say marriage, but we have to understand what marriage is. It's a covenant commitment, and it's really sexual desire that drives us to pursue covenant. And sex is the celebration of covenant, and faithfulness is the promise of covenant, and all that really reflects who God is. You know, sex is a very spiritual thing. But we've seen uh, in culture that it's normal now for men and women to say sex is about personal expression and identity, and my relationship is totally different. I don't have to have a relationship to have a sexual expression with someone. And that plays out in all different ways. Um, But just the confusion around sexuality, again, even among Christians, where they don't Uh, even have any understanding of the basics of why God created male and female, why there are uh, certain restrictions about how we exercise our sexuality in Scripture. Like, why would God care about that? That understanding is just really gone. And so we have to kind of start back uh, three steps from where we used to be able to start a conversation around sexuality. Why do you think we've, we're seeing this regression? Because in a culture that is much more forward with yeah. sexual relationship and, and everything from what we can watch on television to, you know, conversations. And, and some of those things are you're kind of like pulling back at your cuticles and some things you're, you're going, good. I'm glad that we're busting this open and talking yeah. about it. But why do you think we're seeing this regression on something that for a lot of us in the faith community would seem so foundational and would seem so, of course, people should know that there's this connection between sexuality and, and covenant. But why, why are we not seeing people really have that anymore? Mm. I really believe that every sexual issue is at heart a spiritual issue. And so you have to pull back um, you know, by asking questions like you just asked, why are we seeing this trend? And it really has nothing to do with sex. It really is rooted in the fact that we've become, over time, more humanistic and individualistic. And, and so we live in a culture that says there is no moral authority outside of your own personal expression, your own desires. And uh, our culture pretty much says the only moral law is don't hurt somebody else. But there's no understanding of morality rooted in a worship for God or recognizing that there's a being outside of ourselves that has the right to put restrictions on us for anything. Um, So we live in a culture today that is all about you. You are God. And your goal in life is to self-actualize, to be the best you you can be. You do you. If you want to find truth, Really look in your heart and figure out what you want, what you believe, what you feel. That's a predominant thought in our culture, right? right? right. I mean, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So just like we've seen in Scripture, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the people of God begin to take on the flavor of their culture. And their worship of God gets distorted by the worship of the culture. And so really what we're seeing in in the Western church is Christians that are humanists. And they begin to believe that God exists to meet my needs. Uh, And so that means that a loving God would never tell me not to do what I want to do. A loving God would give me exactly what I desire. After all, he made me this way. And so the thinking becomes really twisted, not just related to sexuality, but related to everything in life. Every other thing that is touched by that, right? I was recently speaking at the Intentional Family Conference, and Jeff Bethke was there. And one of the things that he talked about was exactly on this, just saying that 
within this very individualistic culture, we've forgotten the notion of what it means to be on a team. And so Mm -hmm. for our families and as couples, it's very difficult for us sometimes to really identify as a team and what's healthy for a team existence. We do it in our workplaces. We do it with our churches where we talk about, we need you on the volunteer team, you know, and we do all these team building activities, but we sometimes miss it in the place that it's the most important, which is within the context of family and most importantly in that couple. And so when we have those expressions that become all about self-fulfillment apart from team play, yeah, I can see how you can get there, that this is one of the trends that you see, that people don't even have a foundational understanding of that covenant moment being so intertwined with this physical act of sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. And so we see that in culture with, you know, people cohabiting instead of getting married. We see it in the rise of pornography, the hookup relationships. But we also see this in marriage with a man and a woman having sex. Um, Because even though they're having sex, the sex is still about you're supposed to meet my needs. I got married so that I would be sexually fulfilled, and you're not sexually fulfilling me. And so our marriage must be broken. You must be broken. I must be broken. So maybe we should get a divorce and find somebody else. Um, and Break so, up all the broken. <laughs> yeah, and so the whole sexual relationship is still around. It's all about me meeting my needs. And, uh, and so even though on the outside it looks like, okay, here's a Christian married couple, they're supposedly having sex, when you really get into what's going on, there's a lot of dysfunction even within what looks like it, it's God-honoring and normal. This taps into something that has been a trend that's been quite fascinating for myself and for someone that I teach pretty frequently with that we have tested and we have asked questions and done surveys. And when we ask couples about their sexual relationships and how things are going, and we allow this to be an anonymous survey, but they send back into us their top questions and the things that they're experiencing. We have now, with several different groups, had report back to us that, yep, about 50% of the time we'll have guys saying, the frequency of sex in my marriage is not where I want it. I want it more than she does. But 50% of the time, it's the women saying, Mm -hmm. I'm the one who's wanting sex, and he's the one putting me off. And for my friend and my colleague who has long been a psychotherapist, he just keeps scratching his head like, what what is going on? This is not, you know, what we're accustomed to seeing in terms of some of the education and experience that he's had. He's a little bit older than I am. But it absolutely aligns with a lot of the conversations I have with women in ministry. It doesn't surprise me in the least. I hear very frequently women say, saying, oh, no, I'm the one who really wants to be in sexual contact, and it's my spouse who's telling me he's tired or he's not interested. So is this matching what you're beginning to see a lot in your work? absolutely. Yeah, um, I'd say like 10 years ago, the stats would be that maybe in about 25 to 30 percent of couples, you'd see a woman uh, with more desire for sexual intimacy than her husband. Uh, now, I agree, it's it's around 50-50. And when you just are looking at younger marriages, that younger demographic, I think it's actually more common for the woman uh, to want sexual intimacy more than the husband does. So, uh, And it's not just us that are seeing it. Whenever we're connecting with other ministries that are uh, dealing with marriage, dealing with sexual issues, they're saying the same thing. They're saying the same stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that is attributed to? Well, first of all, we've got to say that in maybe about 20, 25% of couples, it's just a normal variance. Okay, so unpack that for me. Yeah, so it can just be like in with the average couple, the woman is usually shorter than the man, right? But every now and then, you'll see a couple where the woman is taller than the man. You're like, that's a normal variance. Right. Uh, sometimes people just fall outside the bell curve. And that can be with sexual desire, too. It can be hormone levels. It can just be wiring. It can be love language and how you express yourself. Uh, but when we look at the average man's body, he has 10 times more testosterone than the average woman. And testosterone is the main hormone in both men and women that creates sexual desire. So it should be normative within a culture that most marriages are reflected that the man is the initiator and that he's more interested in sexual intimacy and that the wife really most of the time is more just having a receptive uh, attitude towards that, like, wow, he's initiating, I can get going, that sort of thing. That's really more what we're used to seeing and even what our biology would say. Um, so I say all that to say if you're in that in that situation where you're the wife that wants sex more often, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem. 
you might just fall outside the bell curve in terms of... Could just be a biochem signature. Yeah. yeah. But the fact that we're seeing such a change in this dynamic means there's something that's not normal going on. And so what do you think that might be? Do you have some theories as to why we're seeing some of that? I do, yeah. I think it. uh, What from what I've seen, the trends, there are a couple different reasons. Some people are even talking about the environment and the environmental impact on men mm-hmm. with uh, hormones and our right. meat. and phytoestrogens. Our, yes. And, yeah, yeah. and so that's certainly part of it. Right. Uh, and for some people, that's, that's it. But I think there's more to it than that. Uh, first of all, I think that women today are encouraged to be more sexual, and they're being sexually awakened much younger. You know, the average story of um, people in our generation was, Wow, you know, as a woman, I thought about getting married and dreamt about my wedding, but uh, a lot of women weren't really sexually awakened until late teen years, and even then, they weren't encouraged to be sexual. And their difficulty in marriage has been, how do I become sexual? Like trying I, to overcome yeah. some of those restrictive yeah, you know, like restrictions that they may have. Good girls don't right. do this, or right. they don't right. enjoy that. That's not the case today for younger women. Uh, they're growing up being encouraged to explore their body, to be sexually awakened, and to be sexual in marriage. So I think that's part of it, uh, which that's not necessarily a bad that thing. That could be a good thing. There's right. some really good things coming right. out of that. Right. The, the other two reasons, I think, are more problematic. So uh, the second reason would be that we are seeing uh, an emotional trend in marriage and relationships where women are more dominant and men are more passive. Uh, and so women are the ones, you know, the research will show that are getting the degrees, that are encouraged to achieve their dreams, um, that have tend to have more of that take charge attitude, whereas men are really lagging behind and having dreams and pursuing uh, what's on their heart. Uh, they, they tend to take the back seat. They don't initiate even a date. Right. You know, they're, right. they're scared. And uh, masculinity is really being discouraged in our culture. And so an average man and a woman gets married, and the woman is naturally now going to be the one setting the tone and uh, maybe even treating her husband like she's annoyed with him, like he better get his act together. This plays out in the bedroom. I mean, you know, sexuality has a lot to do with how we feel as women and as men. And a man who feels emasculinated everywhere else is naturally going to, to feel act, that way in the yeah, bedroom. Yeah, yeah like yeah. why would I don't feel like a man any other time of the day with you? Why would I now? Mm-hmm. And men don't know how to say that, and women don't know what to do with that, and so they get it caught in this cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be the second reason. The third reason uh, is pornography. We know that pornography is just ubiquitous in our culture right. for women and men, but particularly for men. And the more we study what pornography does to the wiring of the brain and the sexual response of the brain, uh, it, for many men, literally makes it impossible for them to achieve sexual excitement in a normal sexual situation. Unless they're thinking about pornography, their brain has been tricked out to respond to things that are totally unnatural. And not only images that are unnatural, but they've trained their sexual response to be, I get exactly what I want, when I want it, how I want it. And uh, they're trying to be sexual with a woman who needs to needs you to be patient, uh, who needs you to communicate, who needs you to delay gratification. And a lot of men, if they're really honest, they'll just say, it's too much too work. Much work. <laughs> I can't do it. Like I tried that, but <laughs> pornography is just it's a whole faster lot of, and more efficient. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and some of them will just say that. You yeah, know, like yeah. I've just I've just decided to take matters in my own hands, literally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. But what do you do with that as a thirty-year-old yeah. couple? Right. Where it's like, wow, we did not anticipate that. And most young couples really believe that when we got married. The pornography problem would be gone, and sex would this be This will great. replace it, and this yeah. will, yeah. But unfortunately, that does not seem to be the way that it plays out. And, you know, we're seeing, too, rising numbers of women using yes. pornography, which is something that historically is pretty new over the last 10 years or so. Some of the last stats that I saw were now claiming that we had women, women of faith, 
who were saying to like a 40% degree were using pornography as part mm-hmm. of a daily, you know, or a weekly experience for them. And that that is a huge sea change as well, even just in that it's available to women. You know, yeah. that there a lot of times some of these things were only available to men. So we only saw the after effect and the impact on men. But now, of course, it's a, quite a democratic process. Like yeah. <laughs> everybody has access. So mm-hmm. how do you think that pornography impacts women is it much the same cycle that we see for men or for women who are utilizing pornography is there a little bit of a different riff yeah i think um there are some similarities just again with the brain responses to that degree of stimulation and training your brain that way um but we even know that female pornography can be different it it can tend to be more story based i think 50 shades of gray really opened the door to make female pornography effective and acceptable and so for women they can have storylines attached but also it can just be straight arousal and women will tend to talk about how you know that's just where I've learned to go being depressed or lonely and they'll express the same sort of thing as men will where it's like I cannot become stimulated unless I'm looking at porn or thinking about porn. Um, so there's those, some of those same things. But women, I think, have more of a disconnect. Like one of the difficulties of working with men when they're struggling with pornography is they really can believe what I do over here with my smartphone does not affect. Is one thing. Yeah. Right, right. Like it's in this It's box. compartmentalized. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean I don't love my wife. It doesn't mean that I'm not attracted to my wife. Um, working with men, a lot of times making that connection is a big goal. For women, they already have that connection. Uh, they experience their sexuality as being spiritual and emotional and relational. And so there tends to be a lot more shame related to not just the pornography use, but my sexuality as a whole. Uh, and they just want to shut everything down because it's all connected. Right, right. They're not compartmentalizing at the same level. Back with Dr. Julie Slattery in just a minute. How do you want to be remembered? I've thought about this a lot lately, and it's a little complicated to answer. I want people to remember me for the way I loved them or that I was always up for a heart-to-heart conversation. But if you look at how I'm really spending my days, you'd find a big focus on plain old busy. Sometimes the things that seem to take up our time or focus aren't actually the things that are most important. And that's why I'd love for you to check out my newest Bible study from Abington Women called Footnotes. It's an exploration of four people we find in the Bible, people just like you and me, who end up being remembered for some things in their lives that they might have thought weren't all that important or influential, but in the bigger scheme of things, were. How do you want to be remembered? Check out Footnotes wherever you buy your books or at abingtonwomen.com slash footnotes. Now, I'm sure that I have listeners out there, too, who are going, well, that is not my problem. He's the one who wants it all the time. I don't. Mm -hmm. And they are struggling to find effective means other than just trying to shut everything down, which, you know, we know that's not the answer. So... If you find that you are out of sync in Mm -hmm. terms of the desire that you have for your spouse over your spouse's desire for you, what are some effective things that are healthy, that create a great environment, that are not things like the utilization of pornography to help get those levels of desire a little bit more in sync? Yeah. You know, first of all, I think you got to see the big picture. You've got to see that for most marriages, there's going to be incompatibility or at least seasons of it. Right. And At some level, I believe that that's part of God's design for sex. Why did he make men and women so different? He could have made us very much the same related to our sexuality, and life would have been a lot easier, right? (laughs) But I think one of the reasons he made us so different, even before the fall, is because it requires that we approach sex with love. You know, Otherwise, we could stay stuck in that this just makes me happy and I please you when I'm pleasing me. And it doesn't require patience and communication and mercy and forgiveness and all the things that building a great sex life requires. And this is true when there's an incompatibility with how often you want sex. It's requiring both the husband and wife, regardless of what shoe you're wearing in this season of marriage, to say this isn't just about me, this is about us. And what does God want to teach me about love in this situation? Uh, If you're the one with a higher desire, being loving is, all right, I need to channel my desires towards my spouse 
and wait and be sensitive and and do the things that help my spouse get interested in sex and, and be patient. If you're the one with low desire, it means, all right, out of love, I need to make sex a priority. And women often struggle to make sex a priority. Um, you know, there's, there's issues certainly like emotional trauma and sexual abuse and, and relational problems that, that can get in the way. But sometimes they also just have trouble enjoying sexual intimacy because they're so complicated. Um, you know, for a woman, it's not, for most women, it's not as simple as I think about sex for five minutes, I'm ready to go. It's I've got to get my mind in gear. I have to feel safe. I have to feel connected. I have to be rested. Uh, I have to feel good about my body. And they feel like if all those things aren't up and running, then they can't experience healthy sex. And so for a woman, a lot of it is, you know, challenging that woman. What direction are you moving into? And what I mean by that is instead of having this perfection mentality, um, and I've had to do this in my marriage during different seasons, am I being intentional about moving towards a healthy sexuality? Um, am I praying about it? Am I, if needed, going to see a counselor to help work through issues? Am I reading a good godly book about sexual intimacy and marriage to help me get God's perspective? Uh, my husband and I, are we talking about sex? Not just do you want to do it, but what pleases you? And, and uh, when, when has been your favorite time that we've had sex? And, you know, how can I get you in the mood? How are we learning to have those conversations? And a lot of women that just hate sex, they, they don't know how to take those steps of moving in the right direction. You know, I have known that I've had this experience now with some women that I minister to where they have identified, and it's taken a lot of courage, but they've identified that they went through a sexual abuse situation in their past or some some event that they have held very, very shameful. And they've now come to a place of saying, so that happened to me and that's why I have no sex drive. So he's just going to have to understand that. Mm -hmm. And in this very strange way, it becomes this place of almost you know, it's, it's holding the sexual relationship hostage based on the trauma that you've had, which may be very valid trauma, but that's never a place to stop. No. That's never a place to say, and this is where we pitch the tent. You know, that's yeah. not a place to stay in camp. But then I've also seen people use experiences they've had in the relationship. Well, he hurt me this way, or he did that, or he said that, and therefore he is not getting it anymore, or he's only going to get it once a month, or Speak to those times where we can hold sex hostage mm -hmm. and how we can be very cautious to make sure to look for the warning signs when we're beginning to try to use sex as this bargaining chip or as this punishment or as this yeah. reward kind of thing that can get really off kilter. Because sometimes as we talk about desire, you know, someone who has a higher desire, someone who doesn't, we also see people wield power yes. with it. Yeah. It is a different conversation than desire. So Absolutely. how do you see those yeah. things? Yeah, for sure. And sometimes it's all mixed in together. Together. Yeah, it's a whole big mess. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times, even the way we're using power is uh, subconscious. So right. I may feel like I have no sexual desire, but it's really because I have a deep fear and uh, and I want to be in control. And so being sexual means I'm out of control, control. and I'm vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is why we will ask the question, are you moving towards intimacy? Because moving towards intimacy may not be having sex right now. It may be, Lord, would you show me the lies that I'm believing that are keeping me stuck here? Um, you know, but I think something that's helpful for just everyone, and it's a great gut check, is realizing that sexuality in your marriage, and even in your own life, is a spiritual battlefield. It's a territory. Mm -hmm. So if you were to picture a field... And ask yourself very honestly, what percentage of that field does Satan still own? That's that's a gut check. Right. It's right. like, because if there's bitterness, Satan owns that piece. Right. You know, if there's fear because of what's happened to you before, Satan has, he owns that piece. If there's no intimacy in your marriage, Satan owns that piece. And if you've been traumatized or abused or betrayed, Satan has taken enough. Are you going to let him continue to hold on to that ground for the rest of your life or are you going to invite God to reclaim it and that's why when a couple can get the picture of it's not about how often we're having sex it's about are we as a team working towards watching God reclaim this in our marriage reclaim this in our brokenness it's a whole different dynamic 
So good. So good to really have this awareness that absolutely, you know, we talk about that, you know, the enemy comes against us in all these ways. The enemy's, you know, trying to come after our marriages. But do we get as granular to understand, oh, but not just the marriage broadly as a concept, (laughs) but but in our sexual connection with our spouses, that in and of itself is a battleground as well. Such a great reminder. So 2012, you branch out and start this ministry. You've been writing books and you have a book that just came out recently called Rethinking Sexuality. So Mm -hmm. what was the genesis of this book and and how did you decide this was something that you wanted to explore further? So give us all the details. (laughs) Yeah. Well, this book is different from any other that I've written. And it's really looking at what God has taught me over the last six years of ministering to Christians on the topic of sexuality and seeing trends of how the church has been ineffective. Just a great example. So I'd go to a church and do an all-day women's conference on sexuality and really open up the can of worms of what is biblical sexuality and what's the spiritual battle and what does healing look like and what does this look like if you're single or married. We talk about all those things. And then the church leaders or counselors in the area would basically say, we don't know what to do now. Like, you're starting conversations no yeah. <laughs> we've never had. Yeah, yeah. And I think every Christian leader right now is feeling this way, as these conversations are becoming more normal and as brokenness is becoming more normal. Christian leaders, pastors, counselors, parents, small group leaders, you feel like you're a deer caught in the headlight of no one taught me how to address pornography. No one taught me what to say when somebody asks, what does God think of gay marriage? No one taught me what to say if two 20-year-olds want to live together and they don't understand what's wrong with that. We've just always kind of assumed that everybody knew these was rules. working off the same base. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so rethinking sexuality is really about kind of like examining uh, the paradigms that we've been using that that really have never worked, but right. today are totally not working. Very evidently, have not yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, and going back to scripture and saying, okay, well, what is the biblical model? What is what is the biblical paradigm that we should be using? Like for example, I think we've been using uh, subconsciously. A paradigm in the church that only some people are sexually broken. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've been abused, if you're looking at porn, if you have LGBT issues, you're broken. And everybody else has it together. All together. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And so people that that are experiencing those kinds of symptoms are like, I don't belong in the church. And if if I am in the church, I better not tell people what I'm thinking or what I'm doing because they have it all together. And now if we look at the story that Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector, that's exactly what we've set up related to sexuality in the church, where the the church leader says, oh God, I'm, I thank you that I'm not like these I'm other amazing, people. And I'm not like them, and I don't have yeah. the same kind of problems. Right? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I got married as a virgin, and I have sex with my wife, and I don't want to get a porn. Thank yeah. you, God. Yeah. You know, I'm so righteous. And this other person is just on their face saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said that only one of them walked away absolved of their sin. Right. Because only one of them saw their sin. Right. And uh, so we really have set up, uh, without realizing it, this attitude around sexuality that only certain people need help. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us have to pretend that we have it all together. Uh, which is it's so not true. Everyone has sexual brokenness. Everybody's dealing with pain and confusion in these areas. But people just feel like they have to hide it. Uh, and I think particularly Christian leaders feel like they have to hide it because you're not supposed to struggle with those things. Right. And I think that's led to some of the really difficult and heartbreaking situations that we've seen even just in recent months with leaders that, you know, you never would have thought would have fallen and had put into place, some of them, all kinds of gates and things that they thought were going to keep them safe. But I think that first place that is so important that you talk about is the understanding that we're all sexually broken at some level. I mean, you can have waited for marriage, you can be having sex with your your married partner so many times that you, you know, a week that you think is all performed, but if it's all very selfishly based, Mm -hmm. and if it's not that giving over to each other of one another's bodies, well, then Technically, that would be sin. So yeah. kind of and brokenness. A, and brokenness. So, you know, it's, it, it is it's that It's even place. these attitudes that, you know, sex is about a man's pleasure and it's really not for women. And it, there's all forms of ways that we've distorted this. We've allowed the enemy to distort it. 
I mean, so when we can all just say, you know what, we have a lot of maturing to do, we can all be part of the same conversation. So we may have listeners who are, are taking this in and they're saying, man, we need to get to some help. Like, we really need to go figure out what to do next. And you're right, there aren't a lot of people out there who are who are of faith who are really equipped. I mean, we all have heard the stories of the couple that goes in who's having a hard time matching their levels of desire, and they're told by a counselor to go watch porn. Like, you mm-hmm. know, we, we know those things exist out there. So if we have someone listening who's going, I really need to get some help with my spouse, and we need to take next steps, what are some things that people should be looking for for someone who can validly and appropriately and effectively speak into helping them span some of these places of brokenness that need to be healed? Yeah, um, great question. So first of all, I said earlier in our conversation that every sexual issue is at heart a spiritual issue. So anytime you're going to a book or a counselor, you have to know where that person is in, in the respect for who God is and what they believe about the authority of, of the scriptures. If you go to somebody who's a Christian who says, you know what, I think the Bible is a good guidebook, but it's outdated, that person is going to give you worldly counsel because they're saying by that statement, um, God is a good friend to help you in trouble, but he's not the Lord of the universe. And he doesn't have the moral authority to tell us what's right and wrong. So that's a red flag, whether you're going for a sexual issue or any other issue. That person's coming from a humanistic worldview. So you want to ask questions. If it's a book, you want to see who published it. You want to see what are this person's you know, spiritual credentials. How do I know that they're safe? They're going to come from a biblical perspective. Now, why do I say that? Because Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now, I have a doctorate degree in psychology, but I can tell you that the wisdom that I have has come from the Lord. And if I rely on my psychology degree and chuck who God is, please don't trust me, (laughs) you know, because (laughs) we're seeing in the world, it will end in pain because it's foolishness when we let go of the fear of the Lord. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is there really are people that are trained and equipped in specialties. And there are people that are trained in trauma recovery, people that really have spent their lives studying marriage dynamics or sexuality. And so you want to find out what training do they have, what experiences do they have uh, in terms of learning skills and techniques that are going to be helpful. Um, ask ask for testimonies. You know, if, I know it's a it's an embarrassing thing to do, but go to your pastor and say, who do you know in our community that is a great biblical counselor to address intimacy issues? Um, Focus on the Family has a really great uh, counselor referral network all over the country where you can look for specialties, and they screen every counselor related to their faith perspective and the kind of wisdom they'll be giving. There are great books, podcasts, resources, seminars, Bible studies. Um, So take advantage of those. Um, Our ministry, Authentic Intimacy, is one place we're trying to create and really to promote those kind of resources that are being created even outside of our ministry that are going to be helpful for people. Well, Dr. Julie, thank you so much. The book is Rethinking Sexuality. Your ministry is called Authentic Intimacy. We'll make sure we get all that in the show notes so that listeners can find that. Just can't thank you enough for just your openness and your willingness to make this part of a conversation that we should be able to have more and more easily, because I think those are the things that bring wholeness and awareness. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Well, thanks for having me. Our content coordinator, Rebecca, puts together amazing show notes for every episode, and you can go to those show notes to find all the places that you can connect with Dr. Julie Slattery. You'll also find in those show notes various resources and notes from this power-packed episode. While you're on the webs, go check out allmomdoes.com and on the socials, a fantastic community of women raising those kids, nurturing that romance, chasing that side hustle, all in the journey of faith. I'd love to hear from you too. Come say hi to me on the grams. That's where I hang out the most at Instagram. You'll find me at Julie Lyles Carr. Let me know what you thought of this episode, what you agree with, what you didn't, and what topics and guests you'd like to hear in upcoming episodes. A big thanks to Rebecca and Donna, our content coordinator and producer, and we'll see you next time on the Modern Motherhood Podcast. Podcast.